Thank you for joining us at the Yeshiva University's Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs Herrenstein Center. Uh, I should say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This is a, uh, a global conversation that's taking place, and I'm honored to be with my colleagues today. Um, Israel was central in the thinking of Rabbi Sachs. Rabbi Sachs spent part of every year in Israel. And as we're approaching the 75th anniversary of Israel, and certainly Yom Hazikaron, those who paid the ultimate price for the establishment of the state of Israel, we thought it would be appropriate to uh, highlight some of Rabbi Sachs's thinking um, from different students of his thought. And um, I'm going to begin. I'll be sharing my screen. We've called this the impossible dream. And, uh, and it allows us to think a little bit about the visionary leadership that it took to establish the state of Israel, and also to delve much deeper into our own ancient traditions um, and texts. So I wanted to start off with a book that, uh, that has spread like wildfire throughout Israel and been translated, Micha Goodman's The Wandering Jew, Israel and the Search for Jewish Identity, where he discusses a distinctive aspect of the land of Israel that we'll return to in thinking about how, how diaspora and Israeli Jewry are different. In Israel, uh, Dr. Goodman writes, there are four components of Jewish identity that Israeli Jews breathe in through the air, their location, their nationality, their calendar, and their language. So let's bear those distinctions in mind as we look at the Gemara Menachot and then the way that Rabbi Sachs understood this, uh, this very intriguing piece of Talmud. Um, in the Gemara Menachot, we read that if someone has socher by its bachul, if someone rents a home in uh, the diaspora, kol shloshim yom patur minam zuzah, mehechan ve'elach hayav. So if one rents a house in the diaspora, you one is exempt from the commandment of putting on a mezuzah up until the 30th day. After the 30th day, one is obligated. However, aval has socher bayit be'eretz Yisrael, osem zuzah l'alter, mishum yishuv de'eretz Yisrael. This is an interesting distinction. I sort of wanted to enter into the thinking of Rabbi Sachs on the land of Israel, through this, we won't call it an obscure law, but I think an intriguing law. And that is that if one puts up a mezuzah in the land of Israel, uh, or if one buys an, apar uh, an apartment, rents an apartment in the land of Israel, one must put up a mezuzah immediately. So if one is in the diaspora and has an apartment or a home that one rents, one does not need to put up a mezuzah for the first 30 days. But if it's in the land of Israel, one must do it, do so immediately. And Rabbi Sachs um, explains in his uh, Covenant and Conversation essay, Encampments and Journeys on Parsha Pekude, in Jewish law, one who rents a house outside Israel is obliged to affix a mezuzah only after 30 days. Until then, it's not yet regarded as a dwelling place. Only after 30 days does it become de facto a home. In Israel, however, one who rents a house is immediately obligated mishum yishuv eretz Israel because of the command to settle Israel. Outside Israel, Jewish life is a way, a path, a route. Even an encampment, a place of rest, is still called a journey. So this distinction between a sense of a psychic sense, not only a practical sense, but a psychic sense, that if one rents anywhere outside of Israel, the house is never really a permanent home, even if it is a permanent dwelling, because the idea is that collectively and individually, we must feel that our destination, our prayers, our, our, the, our, the forefront of our thinking, the centrality of Israel, it, it affects us and impacts us no matter where we are, that we will never achieve permanence of home unless we live in Israel. Um, in Traditional Alternatives, which is one of the first books that uh, Rabbi Sachs published, I was actually in the registrar's office in Jewish College when that boxes of those books came out for the first time. He writes, for Jewish peoplehood to become a concept that embraces a continuity of Jewish life, 
past, present, and future, there must be an asymmetry between Israel and the diaspora. So I want to think a little bit about what asymmetry means, uh, this, the asymmetry between a permanent home and a temporary dwelling, that Jews have spent the vast majority of their history away from home, and that most Jews today do not live there, neither compromises nor contradicts the fact that Jewish life is a, li a life lived toward Israel. So I'm going to stop the share for a moment to think about the perspective of saying, even if I'm not living in the land of Israel, my perspective is always a life towards Israel. Um, the, the fact that Torah comes out of Israel, scholarship comes out of Israel, Jewish identity may begin and is centered around Israel means that wherever I am, there's a focus, there's a locus of my thinking and, and my ultimate life. And, and thinking about how that might have changed for someone um, who was living in the diaspora and represented diaspora living for thousands of years before there was a state of Israel. And now that there's a polity, a national polity of the state of Israel may make a difference. I wanna also focus on something Rav Salvechik uh, mentions or, or writes about in Kol Dodi Dofeg. I know that Dr. Weiss will soon be talking about Kol Dodi Dofeg. So I just wanna touch upon an idea that I think um, that, that Rob Sachs then uh, pivots towards, and I'll go back to my screen share um, for the remaining few minutes of my talk. So um, Rav Soloveitchik writes that Judaism is always distinguished between an existence of fate and an existence of destiny. The difference between what he calls a Brit uh, Yehu a Brit Goral and a Brit Yehud, fate and destiny. And what's the nature of the existence of fate? It's an existence of compulsion, an existence of the type described by the Mishnah, against your will do you live out your life from Avot. A pure factual existence, one link in a mechanical chain, devoid of meaning, direction, purpose, but subject to the forces of the environment into which the individual has been cast by providence without prior consultation. The sense that one in by fate has been moved from place to place. And certainly when you think about our own, many of us who have immigrant families, where we landed, where we left Eastern Europe under our own, uh, our own devices or felt compelled to leave for reasons of persecution and oppression, and people landed willy-nilly. They may have had an uncle or an aunt or, or a grandparent or a child or a brother living in Australia or South Africa or South America or, or somewhere in America. And that Brit, go, Brit uh, Goral, that sense of, the, of, of, of fate uh, drove us somewhere, but is not necessarily the life that we chose, the intentional decision that we made about where to live and what to do. That's as opposed to the Brit Yehud, against your will you were born, against your will you die, but you live of your own free will. Here's what, Rav here's what Rabbi Sachs does with Rabbi Soloveitchik's writing. In Israel, Jewish life is a community of fate. There, Jews from the most secular to the most pious suffer equally from war and terror, benefit equally from prosperity and peace. Judaism in Israel is a presence you breathe, not just a religion you practice. Getting back to the Micha Goodman sense of the four component parts of living in Israel, which are different than life in the diaspora. In Israel, as nowhere else, Jewishness is part of the public domain, in the language, the landscape, the character. There you can stand amid the ruins and relics of towns that were living communities in the time of the Bible and feel the full, astonishing sweep of time across which the Jewish people wrestled with its fate as Jacob once wrestled with an angel. And there you become conscious in the faces you see and the accents you hear of the astonishing diversity of Jews from every country and culture brought together in the great in gathering as once in Ezekiel's vision, the dismembered fragments of a broken people joined together and came to life again. I'll stop my share, uh, but just to bring these elements together, what Rabbi Sachs concentrated on are not only the distinctions that perhaps Michael Goodman made between language, uh, calendar, nationality, and location, but a, a deeper sense in quoting Rob Salvechik's thinking of Israel being the place, not where we go by chance, but where we make an intentional decision, whether, whether we live there by choice or whether it has become a place that we visit, write about, think about, take our Jewish identities from, uh, read the news of, make ourselves aware of, its, of, of trends, of political developments, of culture, of music, all of those things we take into account when we think about the centrality of Jewish life. And with that, I will turn over to my friend and colleague, Jonathan Reinhold. 
Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Eric, and thank you for the Sachs Herenstein, Herenstein Center for hosting me. My name is Jonathan Reinhold. I'm the head of the Political Studies Department of bar -Ilan, and I hope to become the first academic director of what we hope will be the Jonathan Sachs Institute here at bar -Ilan. Um, My background with Rabbi Sachs is that um, in the 1990s, when uh, I founded with some other people the Forum for Modern Orthodoxy, Rabbi Sachs was our, as it were, honorary uh, chair and president. And I brought him to uh, Bar Ilan in 19, and sorry, in 2001 to do a, a, a dialogue with Amos Oz, at which Amos Oz said uh, he is ready to serve in Rabbi Sachs's government with Rabbi Sachs as prime minister, but he has to be minister of religion. Anyway. Um, what I want to talk to you about today is, um, is Rabbi Sachs's religious Zionism, because it's a quite unusual type of religious Zionism. So religious Zionism has had two dominant strands. One is the political Zionism of religious Jews, which is simply this. The Jews need a state to protect themselves. We religious Jews support that as well. And that's the uh, Zionism of Rabbi Ryan as the founder of, of Mizrahi, of, of the religious Zionist movement. And the second strand uh, dates back to the 19th century, Rabbis Alkali and Kalisha, and most famously, Avram Yitzhak Kakoin Kut, the first uh, chief rabbi of the Yeshuv, of um, the pre-state uh, Jewish uh, community in uh, mandatory Palestine. So those are well known, but there's a third less well known strand that I will call prophetic religious Zionism. And its uh, purveyors are the religious kibbutz movement, Yeshayo Leibovich, uh, Rabbi Lichtenstein, and Rabbi Rabinovich, who was Rabbi Sachs's teacher. So Rabbi Sachs is a religious political Zionist. I mean, he talks about the Holocaust. He talks about the need for having a home as defined where, as um, somewhere that they have to let you in. In other words, a refuge, and that this is a moral necessity. So uh, he's a political Zionist as a religious person. That is a moral necessity. The second thing is messianic religious Zionism. Now, here, Rabbi Sachs is definitely in line with the sentiment of prophetic fulfillment, okay? Um, but he is very much against the idea that the state, the institutions of the state of Israel, not the country, the state, the political form, is somehow innately holy. So if you look at Rabbi Isaac, uh, Rabbi Avram Yitzhak and Cohen Cook, before there was a state of Israel, he referred to the state of Israel as the foundation of God's throne in the world. His son refer, says rabbis should, in, should intervene in politics in Israel because the divine is concretely revealed in the establishment of the kingdom of Israel. Israeli sovereignty receives its true value and its true content from this very source of holiness. And his uh, student put it even sharper, Rabbi Shlomo Avinah, the government of Israel, a representative of the kingdom of heaven that appears in the world. Yeah, whether this is acknowledged or not, doesn't matter if the people of Israel see it like that or not. That's what it is. And, and the Torah is the constitution of the Jewish state. And any decision of the government to transfer parts of the land of Israel to the Gentiles is in violation of the laws. Now, Rabbi Soloveitchik doesn't follow this. You've heard from um, Erica that there is a resonance for Rabbi Soloveitchik of, of, of the foundation of the state of Israel in, in terms of divine providence. But absolutely nowhere does he use the word Mashiach, Messiah, redemption. There is nothing to be seen in that. And Jonathan Sachs, Rabbi Sachs, follows this. So he writes about how 
the foundation of the state of Israel three years after the Holocaust echoes the words of Ezekiel, the dry bones coming back to life. So there is a resonance with the Bible. There's a resonance with the Jewish religious historic tradition. But when it comes to the state, Rabbi Sachs says that the the political form uh, closest in spirit to Judaism in our time is liberal democracy. And liberal democracy does not aspire to be a vehicle of redemption. And he quotes Yishayahu Leibovitch. Any attempt to see the state as the highest value is a form of idolatry. And while he is and and was known for being a very staunch defender of Israel, much more than people realize because so much of it was done behind closed doors with religious leaders and prime ministers and presidents and the like, for him, it's not only that giving away territory is not forbidden, it is that I believe the Palestinians should have a state if they're willing to live in peace, in brackets, yeah, and that they should have freedom and dignity. Jews did not return home, which goes back to his first type of Zionism, to deny others a home. So what's more unique about Rabbi Sachs is the third type of religious Zionism, and this is prophetic religious Zionism. And here he's echoing Maimonides, who says, look, there's the, there's the welfare of the soul and the welfare of the body. The welfare of the body is uh, about achieving the well-being of society through governance, and it can only be done through a political association. And the welfare of the soul is what we in, the, in, in Jewish diaspora terms for 2,000 years think of as religion. But ideally, says Maimonides and Rabbi Nachum Rabinovich, there are actually two elements. It's just that in the diaspora, one is outside of Jewish control. So what Rabbi Sachs says is Judaism is the constitution of a self-governing nation, but it's about not the state, the society in freedom and in dignity. Okay, only in Israel can Jews live in anything other than an edited edition, because here, yeah, we have to deal as Jews, halachic Jews, Um, religious Jews with society, economy, welfare, education, employer-employee relations, protection of the environment. None of this is possible without a land. But Judaism is about the society, not the state. To be sure we need a state, we need to protect ourselves. We're not naive. Politics is a nasty, can be a nasty business. But the structure is a pragmatic one. Yitra can provide it. Whatever works protects the values. That's what's important. There's nothing intrinsically holy about a state. And that's why for Rabbi Sachs, Judaism should be in civil society, far removed from the structures of power. Okay, it's not about uh, a segregated enclaves code for the Haredim. It's not about territorial ideology code for the the religious settler movement if religion is not seen by israelis as a unifying force in society if religious jews are not admired for their work with the poor the lonely and the vulnerable if judaism is not the voice of justice and compassion then something is wrong with the soul of israel now where can we find this within religious zionism well what is very interesting is the religious kibbutz movement was actually inspired by the Hasidic idea of tikkun olam, where um, humanity is a partner in creation. And anyone who knows anything about Rabbi Sachs knows that he was actually influenced by the Hasidim, Hasidism, particularly of uh, Chabad. And I think it's very interesting that in the religious kibbutz movement, they also use the metaphor of a prophetic uh, idea and their focus is on a self-governing community on and as Labovitch says on a voluntary basis that has to develop ways of living in a fully autonomous politically independent Jewish society 
And that is really a big part of Rabbi Sachs's vision. Now, Rabbi Sachs was certainly not a socialist pioneer, but one element he did, he does hold in common, is the, is the idea that on a voluntary basis, Israel provides, in the words of Aaron Lichten, Rabbi Lichtenstein, and opportunities for societal beautitude, for expressing Judaism in the economic and social sphere in a way that is impossible anywhere else. And the final point is that the prophets rallied against abuses of power by the kings, by the state. And this is also something which Rabbi Sachs found attractive in Yishayo Leibovitch, and indeed, as he said to me, in Amos Oz. And what he felt was that when you are part of the machinery of the state, when you get your money from the state, you cannot call out the government when they behave immorally. And that sometimes raison d'etat, state interests, can become an excuse for all types of immorality. And Rabbi Sachs felt although his style is extremely different from Yeshayahu Leibovitch, who's known in Israel as Navi Zaam, a, a prophet of anger, a bit like Elijah, right? Whereas Rabbi Sachs is more the Nachamu Nachamu. He's more the comforter, the consensus person. But it's the same message. And so I think that this is an extremely valuable train of thought in religious Zionism that has been lost to some degree. But given the divisions in Israel and given the attraction, the unique attraction of Rabbi Sachs to secular Jews, Haredi Jews, modern Orthodox Jews and even non-Jews in Israel, his ability to talk across those divides, this type of religious Zionism has never been needed more than it is now. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Dr. Shira Weiss. I'm the assistant director of the Sachs Gerenstein Center and have the privilege to work alongside Dr. Brown. And I want to develop a couple of the ideas referenced by both Dr. Brown and also Professor Reinhold. Specifically, I want to look at the theological reflections of Rabbi Sachs on Israel in the aftermath of the Holocaust. And in 1989, Rabbi Sachs delivered the Sherman Lectures in Manchester University and published Crisis and Covenant from them, which were his reflections on contemporary Jewish thought. I'll just share my screen so you can look at a couple of the excerpts along with me. But he says there, proclaimed in 1948, the state of Israel represents for many Jews the Jewish return into history and the vindication of the covenantal promise that one day Jews would return to their land. Rarely has a sequence of events lent itself more naturally to theological interpretation. The central drama of the Mosaic books in the threefold sequence of enslavement in Egypt, Exodus, and the revelation at Sinai. He then draws a parallel to contemporary terms. 20th century Jewish history has had its own enslavement and attempted genocide, and its own exodus and entry into the land. Now, several weeks ago before Pesach, Dr. Brown and I discussed some Haggadah highlights in anticipation of Lela Seder. And I mentioned there the Arba Lashonot Gula, the four different terms for redemption that we find in Shemot, Perak, Vav in the Exodus story. And God tells Israel, He'll take the Jews out, save them, redeem them, and bring them to him as a nation. But then there's an additional Lashonot Gula, Veheveti. And I will bring you into the land that was promised to your forefathers. And we see that this fourth Lashon Gula, I related it to the different types of freedom that Eric Fromm and Isaiah Berlin discussed, the freedom from and the freedom to. The freedom from is just the liberation from the external constraints, but the freedom to is saying something more. Freedom too is positive freedom, the use of freedom to behave in ways which are constructive and respond to the genuine needs and wants of the free society by creating a new system of social order. So the goal of the Exodus is a freedom too, to serve God in the promised land, to follow the laws given at the revelation at Sinai. Now the Exodus from Egypt or the more liberation 
the, the, the liberation from the more modern attempt to genocide was not the ultimate form of freedom in the Bible or in modern day. But the state of Israel has brought to the forefront a lot of theological questions that have lain dormant since the end of the biblical period. What's the relationship between divine providence and human action in the interpretation of history? What place does recent Jewish history occupy on the biblical and rabbinic continuum of exile and redemption? Let's look how Rabbi Sachs continues in Covenant and Conversation. I'm sorry, in in um, Crisis and Covenant. He says, the existence of the state of Israel has underlined the postmodern situation of the Jew. It has served as a worldwide focus of Jewish peoplehood and thus deepened the new particularism. The shift it has marked from passivity to the active shaping of history has encouraged Jews in the diaspora to adopt a more activist stance of their own. The Holocaust raised the question of the interpretation of suffering but the founding of the state of Israel raised the questions of the interpretation of redemption, of Jewish destiny, and the covenantal interpretation of history. We see here, as Erica referenced earlier, Rabbi Soloveitchik in Kol Tudido Fate distinguishes between the Goral and the Yehud, the fate and the destiny. And he describes humanity's tasks in this world as to transform fate into destiny, the passive existence of compulsion into an active existence into which one can respond in constructive ways, the freedom too. Rabbi Soloveitchik originally delivered Kol Didido Fik as an address to the Yeshiva University community in 1956. And in it, he interprets Shira Shiri in the Song of Songs, the Megillah that we just read on Shabbat Cholomoy Pesach where the dode and the raya, the male and the female protagonists, are described as once united, but now separated, and longing and yearning to reunite. And in one particular climactic scene in the fifth chapter, after much searching, the dode finally arrives and knocks on the tent of his beloved. Now, the language in the Megillah is very sensual and very vivid and very romantic, and many commentaries interpret it more allegorically as the love relationship between God and Israel and God and his nations search to reunite in the long exile. In Crisis and Covenant, Rabbi Sachs discusses Rabbi Soloveitchik's interpretation of Shir Shreem in Kol Tudido Fake. And he writes there, the transition from Holocaust to national sovereignty was for Rabbi Soloveitchik a divine summons to respond to history. History is not the bearer of unambiguous messages. Instead, like the relationship between the lover and beloved in the Song of Songs, it's a series of intimations that may or may not be recognized and reciprocated. God knocks on the door of human consciousness and all depends on whether we rush to admit him or delay and find that the moment has passed. The Holocaust followed by the creation of the state was such a moment. It posed for Jews the question of whether they would see the sequence of events as incidents of external fate, or as a divine call to inward renewal. Rabbi Soloveitchik implicitly suggested that the messianic character of modern Jewish history depended on how Jews responded to it. Covenantal history is not made by acts of God alone. It's made by the interaction of God and man. As with the Holocaust, Israel encapsulates the central paradox of contemporary Jewish consciousness. On the one hand, Rabbi Soloveitchik writes that it reflects a deep division in conceptions of Zionism, much like Professor Reinhold just mentioned, among and between religious and secular Jews. But on the other hand, Rabbi Sachs explains that the existence of Israel has been the most powerful unifying agent in post-Holocaust Jewish life. For Jews worldwide, few Jews worldwide do not feel involved in its fate and responsible for its support. It has transformed the condition of Jewish existence Hebrew has been reborn as a living language. The Jewish people has been reconstituted as a political nation. And for the first time since the days of the Hasmonean kings, there's a Jewish sovereignty, a Jewish landscape, and a Jewish home. Rabbi Sachs explains the paradox that different views of Israel are not disparate and disconnected, but instead they're variations on a single set of themes, exile and redemption, the roles of God and man in history, and the relationship between the Jewish present and past. Rabbi Soloveitchik in Kol Tudido Fake uses the metaphor of Shira Shirim 
to describe the modern exile and redemption. And he identifies six different aspects or ramifications of the founding of the state of Israel that reflects the role of God's hand, should we choose to see it. In his interpretation of Shir Shirim, he talks about the exile in very vivid terms as he describes the struggles in the Holocaust. He says in source number three, eight years ago in the midst of a night of terror filled with horrors of Maidanic, Treblinka, and Buchenwald, in a night of gas chambers and crematoria, in a night of absolute divine self-concealment, Hester Panim, in a night ruled by the Satan of doubt and apostasy, which sought to sweep the maiden from her house into the Christian church, in a night of continuous searching of questing for the beloved, in that very night, the beloved appeared. God who conceals himself in his dazzling hiddenness, suddenly manifested himself and began to knock at the tent of his despondent and disconsolate love, twisting convulsively on her bed, suffering the pains of hell. As a result of the knocks on the door of the maiden wrapped in mourning, the state of Israel was born. He then goes on to delineate six different knocks, six different manifestations of God's hand, if you choose to view it. First on the political realm, no one can deny, he writes, that from the standpoint of international relations, the establishment of the state of Israel in a political sense was an almost supernatural occurrence. I do not know whom the journalists with their eyes of flesh and blood saw sitting in the chairman's seat during that fateful session when the General Assembly decided in favor of the establishment of the state. However, someone who at that time observed matters well with his spiritual eye could have sensed the presence of the true chairman who presided over the discussion, i.e. God. It was he who knocked with his gavel on the podium. And then in the military realm, the small IDF defeated the mighty armies of the Arab countries. The miracle of the many in the hands of the few took place before our very eyes. From a theological perspective, all the claims of Christian theologians that God deprived the Jewish people of its rights in the land of Israel, and that all the biblical promises regarding Zion and Jerusalem refer in an allegorical sense to Christianity and the Christian church have been publicly refuted by the establishment of the state of Israel and have been exposed as falsehoods lacking all validity. And then he addresses the perplexed and assimilated youth. He talks about God's concealments during the exile, during the Holocaust. At the beginning of the 1940s, it resulted in great confusion among the Jewish masses, and in particular, the Jewish youth. Assimilation grew more rampant. Now suddenly the beloved began to knock on the doors of the hearts of the perplexed, and the rise of the state of Israel slowed the process of flight. Many of those who in the past were alienated are now tied to the Jewish state by a sense of pride. And then the final two, Jewish blood is not free for the taking. It's no longer hefker. The time has come for us to fulfill the law of an eye for an eye. By taking revenge, we raise ourselves up to the plane of self-defense. It becomes the elementary right of man qua man to avenge the wrongs inflicted upon him. And finally, after so many years of exile, there's a safe haven for the Jews. The Jew who flees from a hostile country now knows that he can find a secure refuge in the land of his ancestors. This is a new phenomenon in our history. Until now, whenever Jewish communities were expelled from their lands, they had to wander in the wilderness of the nations and were not able to find shelter in another land. Now the situation has changed. If a particular people expels the Jewish minority from its midst, the exiles can direct their steps into Zion and she, like a compassionate mother, were gathered in her children. These last two are reminiscent of um, Daniel Gordis's new book. There he writes that um, in his book, Impossible Takes Longer, he assesses that the, if Israel after 75 years has succeeded in achieving the objectives of its founders, And he argues that Israel has been successful in changing the existential condition of the Jews all over the world. In light of these last two um, knocks of Rabbi Soloveitchik, they're no longer perceived as the defenseless victims of the historical past. Now, Rabbi Sachs, in a letter in the scroll, describes this heeding of the call of God's knocking, although not in such terms. He writes there, Judaism led ordinary people to lead extraordinary lives. I profoundly believe there's nothing special about Jews. The difference, as Menachem Kellner, Jewish philosopher in Israel, has aptly put it, lies not in the hardware, but the software, not in what Jews are, but in what they are called on to be. Above all, because they never forget their ideals. 
even though they were often powerless to implement them. They were ready for great things when the moment came. Of these, the greatest in modern times was surely the creation of the State of Israel, one of the most unlikely achievements of all time. Today, for the first time in 2000 years, we have a sovereign state in Israel and freedom and equality in the diaspora. As almost never before, we have the chance to succeed where historically as Jews failed in creating a covenantal society in our own land and a genuine dialogue from humanity elsewhere. Now Rabbi Sachs in Future Tense, his delineation of the future, Judaism, Jewish people, Jewish identity, and Israel, describes his future vision in more universal terms. And he says there, and a day will come when the story of Israel in modern times will speak not just to Jews, but to all who believe in the power of the human spirit as it reaches out to God as an everlasting symbol of victory, of life over death, hope over despair. Israel has taken a barren land and made it bloom again. It has taken an ancient language, the Hebrew of the Bible, and made it speak again. It has taken the West's oldest faith and made it young again. It has taken a shattered nation and made it live again. This, as we started off in his first source, this is precisely why for many Jews, the proclamation of the state of Israel represents the Jewish return into history. Thank you. Hello, everybody. It's wonderful to be here with the Sachs Heventeen Center and uh, with uh, Dr. Brown and Dr. Weiss and Professor Reinhold, who I count as my friends. We all tell me them in different ways of, of Rabbi Sachs and Erica and Shira and Jonathan and Johnny are good friends of mine. And it's wonderful to discuss here on the 75th anniversary of the State of Israel, Rabbi Sachs's views. He was born in March 1948. And he grew with the state and always felt a very deep connection as a Zionist um, to that place. Um, my name is Rabbi Dr. Rafi Zaram. I'm the uh, Dean of the London School of Jewish Studies. And a year ago, I was appointed the Rabbi Sachs Chair of Modern Jewish Thought. And, uh, and my task and role is to uh, teach my ideas and spread them and perpetuate Rabbi Sachs's ideas. And he taught me for many years um, uh, to develop his ideas. And he doesn't want people just to repeat them. He wants people to analyze, debate, discuss, and take them further. And so it's an honor to be part of this and, and to do that. So I wanna talk about one particular aspect um, in terms of the Torah's view of the land of Israel. But let me just begin by saying that it wouldn't have, uh, Rabbi Sachs would, would never miss an opportunity to see a direct connection to the Torah in uh, the 75th anniversary. He wasn't into Gematrias, although I've got some interesting stories about that, but he would think about the number 75 and the fact that Avraham was 75 years old in chapter 12 of uh, Bereshit, when Hashem appears to him and tells him to go to the land of Israel, to Yatzatom Micharan, to leave Haran and go to Israel at 75. And that was only the beginning of Avraham's journey. He'd spent many years discovering and understanding the nature and what God was until God appeared to him and spoke to him. And it was only at 75 that God actually spoke to him and took him on this journey to Israel. So in a way, we could say that Israel's just beginning. It's just the beginning of the journey um, as defined by Avraham. Now, let me focus on one particular issue. And it was something that actually upset Rabbi Sachs. It's a historical story, which I will tell you, and how he reacted to it. Um, it was in 19, I think it was in 1997. And he was in Israel talking to a few diplomats and rabbis. And it was just before the proposed Durban conference, uh, United Nations Durban conference, um, which ended up being very anti-Zionist and very problematic in its view of, of Israel. And there was a lot of feelings and negativity of Israel at the time. And when he was sitting around this, uh, this uh, hotel in Jerusalem with these different people, what the diplomat quoted this first source you can see over here. He quoted that it says in the Torah that Bilam the prophet, when he tried to bless the, tried to curse the Jewish people, but ended up blessing them, he said, Am it's a people that will dwell alone. And that's the way it is. The world will always look negatively at Israel. There'll be some supporters, but many people will be anti-Semitic, anti-Zionist, and will always see Israel in a negative light. And that's just the way things are. And Rabbi Sachs writes in the book Future Tense, uh, chapter six, 
And that, that book, Future Tense, by the way, which has been mentioned by, uh, uh, by Shira and, and Jonathan, and actually I think um, Erica as well, is his main book, I would say, about his vision of the role of Israel in the modern world. It's really worth getting hold of Future Tense. Um, he writes in chapter six there that he, when this, when this uh, uh, diplomat said, this is the way it is, we're people that dwells alone, um, he said, no, that, 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 that is what Bilam said, but that's not the way it should be. Levadad, to be separate apart, is not an ideal. Uh, he quotes from Breshit, it's not good for man to be alone. The, the soda we just had, Tazrir Metzora, talks about that the uh, soda, the person has to be bodied, has to be outside the camp, and that being alone is not an ideal. And then, and this he writes in the, in the, in the chapter six, he quotes a number of Gomorrahs that talk about this. So as you know, Bilam tried to curse the people. And when he began, he said, Ma'akov lo, lo kavo, I can't curse because God hasn't let me. And therefore, it was seen as an, a, a blessing, maybe, or he's trying to say something positive about Israel. And you see this full pasuk here, Ki merosh erenu, awish, from the tops I see them, the Israelites, and I gaze on them. They are people that will dwell alone. And they will not be reckoned amongst the people. Now, if you look at all the commentaries of Isaac says, this is seen in a positive light, not in a negative light. This is seen as, as um, we have a special relationship with God. But colloquially and culturally, it, Israel has been seen as a kind of separate outside of view for many people, as, as not ne necessarily deserving of issues. And Jews, many Jews around the world have taken on that view that people don't like us, that they don't trust the state. And their reaction is, well, that's just the way it is. And therefore, we don't care what people think. We have to stop. We have to, don't have to keep trying to explain ourselves. We just know who we are and move ahead. And by Sachs challenges that and says, no, yeah. people that dwells alone is not an ideal. Yes, it was an attempted blessing of Bilam, but actually, and he quotes, and you can see here in source two, he quotes here the uh, Gomorrah in Sanhedrin that says, Every blessing, so-called blessing that Bilam the prophet gave to Israel actually turned out to be a curse. And Rabbi Sachs therefore says that being a people that dwells alone is not a blessing, it's a curse. He also quotes, I didn't have it in the hand out here, but he quotes a, a Gemara in Tanit as well, where the Gemara says, Tova klala shekilel Ahiyah Shiloni, much better the curse of Ahiyah Shiloni, who was a Jewish prophet, Yotemi Brachami Bilam Harasha, better than the Bilam Harasha blessing us. In other words, we don't really trust what Bilam is saying. He might couch it as a blessing, but it's actually a curse. And being alone, seeing yourself as solitary is not an ideal. We need conversation. We need to be able to relate and be part of the world. And so I can quote you now, source three here. This is what he says about this. If Jews distrust the world, they will not seek to understand it and learn how to make their case and win allies in the world. They will see anti-Semitism where other factors are actually at work. They will lend Jewish identity and negativity that will encourage many young Jews to leave rather than to stay. They will fall into the trap of moral solipsism, of talking to themselves in terms only intelligible to themselves. The phrase of people that dwells alone will become a self-fulfilling prophecy that will not go well for the future of Jews, Judaism or Israel. Those who believe that they are destined to be surrounded by enemies will lack the will and conviction to try to make friends. This is a very relevant text for our state, our country today and those who defend it both inside the country and us and diaspora around the world. If we don't want to try and relate and support and make connections with those who appreciate the vision of Israel. If we reject and say we're always going to be uh, seen as an outsider, we won't win friends, we won't work together, and that's not the ideal that the Torah is talking about. So Adkan Rafsak, this is what he says about this issue, and it really made me think about this idea of how Jews take on the anti-Semitism or the anti-Zionism of the world and then turn it as a way of we don't need to relate to them. And for me, the classic source that builds on this, though by Sachs didn't talk about, but I want to develop in this area, is a similar phrase that was said to me many times when I was in university by some, uh, some right-wing rabbis. They said, you have to understand, Rafi, the world hates us. Esau, Sonet, Jacob. Esau and Jacob didn't get on, and Esau didn't like Jacob, and the world doesn't like us. So where's that source from? It's actually Midrash Sifre. We see it over here. Midrash is discussing that famous story when after many years apart, Jacob and Esau meet again and they hug and they kiss. And you, as you all know, there are dots on the word 
uh, by Shkehu that he kissed him, meaning was he really kissing him? Were they trying to hurt, hurt each other? So many interpretations, but this is what the Midrash says. Um, it wasn't a, 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 a liboy. It wasn't a, a kiss, a hug with all his heart. Why? Because second century Israeli rabbinic sage said, Halacha biadua she'esav sone et Yaakov. Halacha biadua, it's a, it's a recognized law that Esav hates Jacob. In this case, it was an exception, and he, he kissed him with all his heart because of their relationship. But really, the way things are is Esav sone et Yaakov. And this is a very powerful statement. This is saying that, Jews will always not be appreciated in the world. Asab as, as being the symbol of the of the uh, of the, the general Western world or the world outside doesn't like Jacob, and therefore you have to just accept that's the way things are. And this phrase, by the way, halacha biyadu, is very unusual. It's not halacha; it's a it's an ideological statement. But and and actually, the phrase halacha biyadu is unique in Midrash, this phrase that he's saying. It's not as if he's making a halachic statement. He's saying it's kind of everybody knows. This is the way things are. And now, how do we relate to this, especially in response to what Bobby Sachs is saying about trying to win friends with the world around? So the move I will make now is one I learned from him. The move Bobby Sachs would often make when understanding text is historical context. Who said it, when, and why? And this is being said, as we saw by Shun by Yochai in second century Israel, which is under the Romans. Um, and uh, there's been attempts at a... Re, uh, tried to start the state of Israel again. And Shun Yochai is very against the Roman domination and control of the country. Goes into hiding at one point, if you know that famous story um, where he does that. And Halacha Biyadua means that this is the way it was, you could read, as was then for him. It's known that we're hated by the Romans and they're controlling us. But does that mean it's an ideal? So I saw another source that relates to this, uh, which can help us, which is even more shocking from Shun Bayocha, but it helps us understand what his ideology was. This is in Masechet Sofrin, it's a, a later um, a part of the Talmud, where Shun Bayochai says, Hatov kochavim horeg. It is best for idolaters to be killed. Now, in some versions of, uh, of uh, Sofrim, it's going brackets, Bishar Milchama, in the time of Milchama, but in other one, in time of war. But in other ones, it just says that there. It's quite a, a kitsoni, it's quite an extreme statement of Shun Bayochai. You can see he was very angry about external domination of the country and didn't trust them and said, as was said in the Second World War, there's a, the only good uh, Nazi is a dead Nazi. And for him, the, you know, that every everyone trying to attack us should be destroyed. But look how he ca- how the, how the, um, Masechet Sofrin continues. And even the best of serpents, you've got to crush its brain. You can't trust a snake, which tells you what he thinks of uh, of uh, idolaters at that point. And then something even shocking for the, for the modern is. And even the best of women indulges in witchcraft. Quite a shocking statement to make for him. And then he ends, uh, happy is the person or blessed is the person who does the will of God, by which he means blessed is the, the man who does the, the, the will of God. So what's going on here? This is clearly contextual to his time. Shimba, in Yushima Yochai's time, women were illiterate. They were uneducated. And the uneducated people who couldn't read and write would just rely on astrology or magic to control the way their, their world was and, and relied on things. And to this day, this is this is how it is for, for uh, edu- uneducated people. They will rely on some magical charm. Um, many footballers, not, not all of them being illiterate, many footballers just before the, the game will will have to kiss some some object in their uh, in their in their in the in the in the, uh, in the in the changing rooms and put it in a certain place so that they make sure that they win their bat, they, that, that they win their match. And this uh this superstition still exists even with educated people today. So Shumba Yochai was talking about women then as, as a little uneducated. But you see his point that he's he's he looks he's quite elitist in his view that the the, the non-Jewish world is not going to understand us and therefore they, they they should they should be killed. You can't trust a serpent and women are difficult uh, aren't, aren't people that understand these things either. So when you contextualize Shumba Yochai, you understand why he might have said Asaf Sone et Yaakov that we are hated outside, but that is not an ideal. And I reject that based on what I've learned from Rabbi Sachs. And I would say to the rabbi who said this to me, that's not an ideal. That was Shun Bayocha making a statement of what was going on then. And I respect and understand that feeling. And you know what? There's many Jews today who feel that, that the world doesn't get us and why bother? 
But Robert Sachs would always fight that. Let me end with a quote um, that uh, a bit later in Future Tense that he says about this. He says, Jews are not destined to be outcasts, pariahs, friendless in the world. With the birth of the state of Israel, Jews are now part of the world. And they have a vital message to impart, a healing presence to enact. They have earned the right and acquired the duty of speaking to the world. Look at that language, earn the right. That's clearly post-Shoah. And acquire the duty. The right leads to a duty to speak to the world, engaging with the world to do so as Jews in the particularity of their face, faith and the universality of their God. Israel, ha Israel as a country has a role to play on the world stage of its ideas and values and traditions that go way back to, way back to the beginning of time. And that's what he feels is important. So we are not a people that ideally should dwell alone, uh, that, that should dwell alone. We are people that should not dwell alone and be part of society. And that is the challenge of Israel going forward in the next 75 years. And to finish, I would say that, you know, American independence every year, people don't talk about the number. It's been here for so long now, 200 years. It's just the independence. And I look forward to the day where we're not in a way counting each year from the beginning, but it's been here for so long, we're so sure and confident of it that we just celebrate your Matzimut as we will this Tuesday night. And, and every year I would, I would Rabbi Sachs as Chief Rabbi would speak and give a different speech, a, rab, a, a, raising, a, a rabble rousing, inspiring speech about, about Israel on the night of your Matzimut. And I miss him this year that he won't be able to do that. But he was a passionate Zionist and believed that we must never give up the uh, the conversation, the, the involved in the states around Israel and the people who, under, who want to learn about it and to build that relationship and never see ourselves as a part and never give up trying to have a conversation and try to make peace and to have hope, which is why our anthem is hope itself. Thank you. I'm so appreciative to all of the uh, people joining us today. We did this, uh, we scheduled this at noon in uh, East Coast American time so that our friends in Israel, our friends in the UK and our friends on the West Coast would all be able to participate. And I wanna thank Rafi, Shira and Johnny for bringing together uh, discussing Israel's place in society and the Jewish place in society, some of the theological questions and challenges and opportunities presented by the state of Israel, and of course, the political and social dimensions of this. Uh, in the few moments we have that are remaining, I wanted to ask our participants today, uh, to, to Shira, to Rafi, and, and to, to Jonathan, do you agree with Rabbi Sachs that Judaism is about society and not about the state? Anyone wanna, any thoughts on that? Do you believe that society, that Israel is about society and not the state? Maybe, um, uh, maybe Johnny, we can go to you first since you added a four, so living in Israel. So I think, I think the state is of Jewish value. Right. It, it is it is important for all the reasons that you mentioned about protecting Jews, about giving Jews dignity. Um, but it's not holy. And the the contribution, I think, the Rabbi Sachs sees for religion today in Israel is primarily in society. There might be a, a, an element of it that that, you know, functions in in the state in that you know our children serve in in the army to protect the state of Israel to protect the Jewish people and and that's certainly a value but I think he thinks and I agree that the more religious uh political parties and groups are involved in trying to gain power uh, on controversial issues and using political power, the more they are involved in divisive issues. And politics is a, it's about interest primarily. So it does damage to a religion that is focused on values and community and a sense of belonging and a sense of kindness and giving. And so I think that I think that that redressing that balance 
um, is the way to go. And I'll just tell a little story, which is uh, at least my wife works in um, the voluntary sector um, and she's the Dabar Torah woman. And it's mainly secular people and it can be Arabs as well. And it deals with people with disabilities and everybody, she always uses Rabbi Sachs and everybody loves it. And it's more than that. They become emotional. And the reason that they become emotional is because they are proud and identify with the Jewish religious tradition, its humanity and its wisdom. And they are alienated by the divisive, aggressive and often extreme politics. So I think here there is a it's it's not whether it's a state or a society. It's that the challenge for us in our day is primarily one that is voluntaristic and social rather than political and authoritarian. Thank you. Anyone else want to take up the challenge? Um, just a small point. My sex often talked about the relationship between the Melech and the Navi in ancient Israel, between the king and the prophet. And the prophet, in, uh, in Johnny's terms, is, is, is the political leader, whereas the Navi was the spiritual advisor and challenger of the king and wasn't actually a political party. And in that sense, Rabbi Sachs preferred much more advice and influence rather than power. And that's the religious voice, that there should be a religious voice. There shouldn't be so much a religious party as a religious voice in all the parties. That the, the, the role of religion and the way the Torah teaches us is not, as Johnny said, because politics is always about interests, all of those interests have to be tempered with moral and spiritual and religious responsibility. And that's why when Johnny said, as though, you know, Amos Oz, that he would see Rabbi Sachs as his rabbi, um, and, uh, and our King Charles would see Rabbi Sachs as his rabbi, that's the point. The religion has a role on the highest levels, but not as a political interest party, but one that all of us refer to, because we're not just, you know, we're not just voters or, or, or consumers, we're human beings that need a, a, moral, a moral sense, and that's the role that it plays. Um, but I don't think my sex ever felt the tar wasn't relevant to every aspect of life, but it had to be understood which part was. And, his, and as, as Johnny and, and as she explained, his, his, his vision for Israel was complicated and is worth reading in depth to understand. But I just thought I'd mention the separation between the, the, the Navi and the Melech. Yeah. Thank also, as, yeah, Rafi mentioned future tense, um, which we all quoted, and that's certainly Rabbi Sachs's um, profound work on, on Israel. And there, he echoes over and over again, finding God in the humanitarianism of everyday life. And he says, only in Israel are they able, if they so choose, to construct an agriculture, a medical system, an economic infrastructure in the spirit of the Torah, and its concern for freedom, justice, and the sanctity of life. So as Rafi was just articulating, the need to infuse spirituality or Judaism into all of the different realms in social life. Thank you. Um, we, uh, we want to make sure that uh, all of our listeners know that we'll be sending out the source sheet so you can review these sources on your own. We'll be also sending out the recording so that you can share the recording and listen to it again. Certainly, we've made a good case for Future Tense. So if you don't own that book and haven't read it, it's a commercial um, for reading Future Tense. And just want to go back to something that Rafi said uh, in closing that I was going to mention, but I'm glad that you mentioned already. The Rabbi Sachs was born in 1948. And, um, and and really his life and the development of his thought in, in some way was always sort of, I wonder if he understood either subliminally or, or intentionally that his life marched with the pace of the life of Israel. Mm. Uh, it's uh, devastating that at, at 75, we don't have him, but we do have the state that he so profoundly believed in and the society that he believed that, uh, that the Torah could uh, contribute to the uh, moral ethical development of society. Rafi mentioned the difference between power and influence. I think you all agree with me that in many ways what Rabbi Sachs had was really a prophetic moral voice in society. And with that, we'll uh, conclude. Thank you for joining us. Chag Hatzmod Samer. Have a uh, inspiring and beautiful uh, Yom Hatzmod. Uh, as we go into Yom Hazikaron tomorrow, thinking about all those who paid the ultimate price with a deep and profound gratitude. Thanks so much for joining us. Shavuot Tov.